Hey North Coast, we're so glad you're with us today. My name's Shara and I work with the Junior High Ministry on the Vista Campus. If you're looking for sermon notes or more information, you can check us out online at northcoastchurch.com. We are continuing our series in Mark, the untold story of Jesus. So grab your Bibles as we jump into God's Word. Hope you enjoy. North Coast Church, how we doing? Man, if you were any hope of encouraging me, you got to do a whole lot better than that, and I need it today. Let's uh, start it. Camera pause. We're going to edit that. We're going to begin right here. Bumper ends. Fade to dark. North Coast Church, how you doing? <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Bunch of fakers. I love it. I love it. Hey, glad all of you are joining from all of our campuses, all of our venues. I know, if you brought somebody new, you're like, you're going to like this guy. He always starts with a story. Not today. So now you're a liar with your friend. I'm sorry. Um, but there's, there's like three family things I want to get through really quick. In almost every one of our campuses, all of our venues, you should have heard in the announcements that we asked for 3,000 backpacks. Not just backpacks, but completely filled with school supplies. Now, not just to date. Uh, the most backpacks we've ever collected um, from y'all, and that's a Texas saying, um, from the church, from y'all, is uh, a 1,700. And so we came up with 3,000 just because. And, uh, and you've collected to date 3,500, I think 90, and they're still showing up. But, but here's what I want to tell you. I wish we could have filmed Every administrator, every principal, um, when they received what they were hoping for, maybe 20 backpacks to help some of the most needy elementary kids coming to school. But instead, trucks pulled up and gave them hundreds. Connor, one of our community service uh, guys, he's actually a pastor over our community service, told me the story about showing up to an elementary school where kids were in great need. And the principal just saying, you don't understand every year how heartbreaking it is to watch a majority of our kids show up empty-handed. They will bring nothing the first day of school. And on that day, oh, we had a giant U-Haul truck waiting for them. And as they got in line and got their backpacks, this is little, little brown-eyed, brown-haired kid. And he goes, I'd like a Pokemon one, please. <laughs> and Connor goes, wait a second. And he jumped into the piles of backpacks because he knew it. And he goes, you mean this one? And the kid's face just exploded. He's all, that's the one. I just got to tell you how proud I am to be part of this church. Whether it's an instrument drive, whether it's backpacks, whether it's community service, whether it's a church planning overseas. Every time we put something in front of you and say, here's a need. You rise up and say, what's the need? Is this the need? Then, then we just want to do this. And it is so humbling and yet uh, so refreshing and so proud to be part of what you're doing here in North County and beyond. Secondly, I, for the first time ever on a weekend, I get to mention a group, Palma Valley Community Church. Um, we've been having conversations with them over the past about 10 months. For the past several months, we've been hanging out there. When I wasn't here, I've been out at Palma Valley teaching and uh, meeting with them, their staff, their elders, and their church. And uh, two weeks ago, after church, their members stayed, and they unanimously voted to become our next North Coast Church campus. Um, isn't that amazing? And basically said, you can have all of our property, all of our facilities. Uh, we're done trying here. Can you guys do this? We've seen enough of what you've done in North County. We want to be a part of it. Now, there's still some legalities. There's still paperwork and transfers and all that that has to be done. Um, so uh, stay tuned. Those of you that live out toward the Palma Valley area or those of you that have friends or family out there, in the next probably month or so, we will be announcing a date, an interest night for those that want to see the campus and hang out. Um, but I tell you, in the last few months, I have fallen in love with those people out there. Uh, so if I stop showing up here, you know where I'm at. Um, but to uh, Reuben and to William and to Tom, their elders, um, to the incredible team there and their leadership, uh, just amazing. And then last but not least, we have a thing called the Daily Dose, where every day we give you a, a little uh, three to five minute, okay, it's usually five minute, um, devotion just to encourage you. We are starting a brand new book tomorrow called Philippians. And tomorrow morning, my hope is, is to start you off with a story, really not much scripture, but the whole story behind this little town, Philippi, and who's writing this book and who they're writing it to. So if you ever wanted to jump in on a daily Devo, you don't have to read. All you have to do is click. It'll be texted to you every morning around 6 or 6.30. All you have to do is text the word daily 
to 51400. 51400, it's of no cost to you, um, and you will get a devotion every Monday through Friday, and tomorrow we start a book, Philippians, so it's a great time to do that. And that's all I have, and uh, really at this point, I'm stalling, um, because you've already read the title, and you're like, oh boy. Can I just say, uh, Chelsea, I love that your friends and some of your coworkers have told you about North Coast. I love that we were in your fine establishment this week, and we got to meet you, and you said you will come to church today for the first time. If you're here today, can I just say with my whole heart, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> give us one more chance. This is going to be hard truth today if you're here for the first time. Uh, to my neighbors who should be in the edge, uh, uh, I love you dearly. Both of you incredibly cool people. And buddy, I know it is your first time ever in your life at church. And you showed up this weekend. Um, we'll talk in the cul-de-sac afterwards. Uh, if you're here for the first time, I say this. Give us one more chance. If you're here and in the next 20 to 30 minutes you want to get up and walk out, I completely understand. This is going to be hard today. This is going to be hard. Here's what I ask. Don't write your communication card and don't leave until the end. We have to do our vegetables first. There is dessert at the end, but I'm still telling you, this is a topic today. Chapter 10, I have seen coming and kept an eye on since chapter 6. And I've been thinking, whose weekend is it going to fall on? <laughs> whose weekend is it going to fall on? And I saw how last week Larry shortchanged his verses. And then left town. <laughs> Coincidence? I don't think so. You see, we go verse by verse to the Bible here at North Coast. We would love to make the Bible say what we want it to say. We would love to just take verses that fit whatever we want to teach that day. But instead, we go verse by verse. We teach the whole of Scripture. For 10 chapters, we've been diving back into history. For 10 chapters, page by page, verse by verse, we've been pulling bits and pieces out of the text. We've been going through what happened around this little Sea of Galilee. What took place that surrounded this man? Where even today, our very dating system, 2019, screams back to him. It's been 2019 since this and this story. He split time, all things before in B.C., before Christ, all things after A.D., Anno Dominion, the year of our Lord. He is Savior or he is swear word to many still today. There is just power in his name. What happened inside these walls of Jerusalem? What happened when fateful night on a cross, three days later with an empty tomb, that has split humanity as we know it? Who was this man and his teaching? And we thought as a church we owed it to ourselves and to you to go back and verse by verse look at this guy whose very birthday is our greatest holiday. The empty tomb we will still do with bunnies and dyed eggs and chocolate rabbits. But we cannot get his birth and his death off of our calendar. And when it comes to his teaching, we teach what he said. And the tension's been building. The opposition hates him. The spiritual leadership Hates him. The crowd is split on what you do with this guy. And by chapter 10, there's a price on his head. They want to get rid of him. And they found the absolute perfect trap. And it comes, revolves around marriage and divorce. So if you got a Bible, we're in chapter 10. I know you're like, you're just starting? I thought you'd close. We've got a good three to four hours ahead of us. Here we go. <laughs> chapter 10, verse 1 in the book of Mark. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea across the Jordan. And again, crowds of people came to him, as was his custom. He taught them. Now, in chapters 1, 2, and 3, we hit that pretty hard. We said over and over again, Jesus' main goal was to... Come on, Carl's bad. Jesus' main goal was to... Teach. And we taught about, he did miracles, he helped people. His compassion came out of him when he saw the brokenness of humanity. But his main goal was not to come and fix your life. His main goal was to come and teach you how to change your life. And when we approach God just trying to get blessings, we are going against the main goal of Jesus. We said if we follow a God whose main goal is to teach, then our main goal must be to learn. To learn. 
How many of our prayers are God give me versus God teach me? Oh, I know that one hits me to the core. Most of my prayers are God give me. You want to encounter the heart of God. Start doing prayers. God teach me what you want to teach me in the midst of this. God, instead of getting rid of my boss who's a jerk, teach me how to work with jerks and show love in here. God, instead of getting rid of my spouse, God, instead of getting rid of this, God, God, teach me what you want to teach me in the midst of this. We may be encountering the heart of God when it's God, teach me, not God, get rid of this. Obstacles may be for us to learn. And once again, as the crowd shows up, he taught, as was his custom. Now, here it comes. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Dun, 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 dun. What do you say about divorce? And here's why they have the perfect test, the perfect trap. They have crossed from the far side of the sea, the Jordan River. They're heading toward Jerusalem. They're now in the area of Judea. This is the area that Herod still controls for the Roman government. This is the area where just a few chapters ago, another guy named John the Baptist spoke against Herod because he married his brother's wife. And John the Baptist says, you can't do that. You can't marry your brother's wife, even if you're more powerful than your brother. (laughs) It's not a good reason to marry your brother's wife. That's not marriage. You can't get divorced. You can't do that. And so what happens, long story short, they cut off John's head and they bring it out in a dinner party on a platter. Oh, now do you see where this comes from? Now that you've stepped into this territory, what do you say about divorce? See, we may just have Rome do our dirty work for us. You want to speak against that? Do you know the history of John the Baptist? I know you do. What do now you say? And it wasn't just trying to get the Roman government against Jesus. It was trying to get the populace against Jesus. That There are two major rabbis teaching in this day on the area of marriage and divorce. There's Rabbi Hillel. And Rabbi Hillel says, you can divorce your spouse for anything you find unclean. And Rabbi Shammai says, no, no, no. You can only divorce your spouse if you find something unclean. You're like, Chris, isn't that the same thing? It's the same thing. But the definitions they used. See, this goes all the way back to the beginning. Read on with me. What did Moses command you? Jesus replied. And they said, well, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hardened that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. You see, this argument goes all the way back to a book called Deuteronomy. Fifth book in the Bible, chapter 24, written about 1450 BC, written by a guy named Moses. And the first five books, the books of the law, they're called the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, or for a good Jewish man and woman, the Torah. This is the very foundation of your faith. And this is what they're arguing about. What did Moses command you? And Jesus takes their trap and throws it right back on them. And they go, well, Moses permitted divorce. That's right. Divorce is never commanded in the Bible. It's permitted for a reason. And it goes back in their law, Deuteronomy 24.1. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something unclean about her, he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. Thank you, Mo. What is unclean? And Rabbi Hillel goes, well, if she... If she makes bad food, she, if the fire alarm is her timer every time she bakes, that's an unclean woman. And of course, in a patriarchal society, this is actually in rabbinical law that they wrote. If she displeases you with what she cooks, you can find someone cleaner. Bravo. Wait, I'll go on. If she is found to be a brawling woman, Let's define brawling woman. If she raises her voice to the point where the neighbors can't hear her, you can find her unclean. (laughs) A lot of us are in trouble on this one. You're like, I live in an apartment. Shame on you. (laughs) Those of you in Bonzo, Fallbrook, you got a couple acres. You may be okay. (laughs) If you see another woman that is more pleasing to your eye, your wife has become unclean to you. And the culture is following Rabbi Hillel. 
We love your definition of unclean. If she makes you unhappy, if he makes you unhappy, you have found them displeasing and unclean. Find something that is cleaner. Bravo. Then there's Rabbi Shammai who says, guys, 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 chapter 24 comes after chapter 23, 22, 21, 20, and 19. Chapter 24 in context is taking a book of a law saying what is moral and immoral, and it spells out what is immoral. It's sexual impurity. Unclean is only if someone sexually has taken their wants, their lusts, their desires, their intimacy outside of the marriage bond. That's in context. Well, guess who culture follows? Yeah, Rabbi Hillel has crowds. Rabbi Shammai has six dudes going, I think that's the Bible. Kind of sucks, but I think that's the Bible. And in the first century, checkmate. Jesus, you strike us as a man that tends to believe the Bible is true and literal. What do you say about divorce? If you answer how we know you're going to answer, Herod may just chop off your head. And if we answer how we know you're going to answer, this crowd will turn on you. Culture will not stand for a biblical teaching of marriage and divorce. Do you see why I didn't want to teach this today? So as I was studying, as I was looking at this, I wrote on my note sheet in my office, be concerned with only one communication card. And let me tell you, North Coast, it's not yours. It's not. There will be a day, because the responsibility I have taken, I'm not better than any of you, I'm not more spiritual than any of you, and I am not held to a higher spiritual bar than any of you. We're all held the same level. I've just been given a gift of gab. I have very few gifts. Maybe gift. That's it. And I've taken that. And I'm going to err in this passage on one side or another. And so one day when I get to heaven, I have to stand before the one who actually spoke in red letters. And there's going to be one or two sides. He's going to say, Chris, I clearly wrote this. (laughs) I clearly wrote this. Why couldn't you teach it as I said it? And at that moment, I don't think I can blame our culture. Or I'm going to get to heaven, and he's going to look at me and say, Chris, you took my book way too seriously. I can live with that. I can live with that. And so here's how I have chosen to go about our outline and what we do with this today. I've chosen to see this as a missionary to Southern California. It's a godless country, it's a godless state, it's a godless culture. We don't live in a Christian nation, a Christian state, or a Christian culture. So I'm going to bring God's word to a bunch of natives who have lived in a culture, and they're going to have to decide culture versus kingdom on this. And yet I'm just going to do the truth, and I'm going to admittedly point out, there are not hundreds, but I believe there are at least a thousand or two of you here at North Coast that over the next 15 minutes of this are going to go, no. No. I don't, no. And here's what I beg you. Stay seated till the end. (laughs) Stay seated till the end. Because I'm going to tell you, I don't want to teach the next 15 minutes either. (laughs) But that is my role. And your role is to listen to it and decide what you want to do with it. God did not command divorce. Moses permitted divorce. And it's because you guys didn't understand what was clean and unclean. And the only reason Moses permitted divorce was because women were getting sacrificed in this culture. Not literally, but emotionally, relationally, and socially. It's because of your hardened heart. Moses said, okay, because you refuse to do marriage God's way, here's what you have to do with the wife if you are going to abandon her. You have to get her a writ of divorce. In other words, in that day and age, unfortunately, 1400 BC, women were seen more as property than equals. And even at that time, God's work spoke and said, not my girl. If you're going to treat her like that, she's at least going to have some paperwork that shows she is free. She's not someone's trash. She's not damaged goods. She's not thrown out property. She has her freedom. That's why Moses wrote you this. And then Jesus answers, verse 6, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. 
Jesus says, look, I'm not going to answer about what you can or can't get divorced. He goes, what I'm going to tell you is you don't have the right definition of marriage. Let me go back and redefine marriage. And I think that may answer most of your questions about divorce. And he goes back to the very beginning, page one and two of the Bible, Genesis one and two. For this reason, God made man and woman and said, you will leave your mother and father and cling to each other and you'll become one flesh. That word flesh there in the Septuagint in the Latin is bios. Did you ever have to take a class in biology? It's the study of life. Two will become one life. Two will become one sphere. That this isn't just a spiritual thing. It's not just a sexual thing. It's not just intimacy. He said, for this reason, this bond of marriage will become greater than any other bond in life, including bond of parents and children. Those that gave you life and brought you into the world, this will supersede that. You will become one flesh, sphere, physically, socially, relationally, spiritually, sexually. The two of you will be fused together. It is a one flesh union. Therefore, if this is what God has created marriage for, you don't separate it. This, that's all you're going to say? What about, 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 what about? And even the disciples get this. It says, when they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. In other words, they're like, excuse me, can you? I didn't want to say anything outside because I'm going to look like an idiot. And for the last five chapters, I've looked like an idiot. (laughs) Can you break this down? (laughs) Anyone who divorces his wife, and marries another woman, commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Well, I'm sorry we asked for clarification. In in Matthew 19, Jesus has the exact same story, but Matthew, being a tax collector, writes a little more. And in Matthew 19, verse 3, it says, Some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? This is a cultural thing. Can't we just get divorced for any and every reason? This is the question he has answered. Haven't you read, he replied, In the beginning the Creator made the male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, just what we read. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hardened. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone divorces their spouse except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is a situation between husband and wife, it's better not to marry. (laughs) I like that. Why in the heck would you put a ring on it? Who would sign up for that? And Jesus' reply, not everyone can accept my words, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Jesus goes, I know what this teaching says. This teaching for a lot of people, it makes them eunuchs. It means they're going to live celibate. If all sexuality is confined between male and female within this fusion of marriage, what's that do for everyone else? And what's that do when you get into a marriage that dissolved because you just knew you gave it your best and it it didn't work? And he goes, let me tell you, instead of trying to read through everything that divorce creates and causes, can I just redefine marriage for you? And I love that he goes back to the very beginning. He says, in the very beginning, God formed man. In the the very beginning, God created Adam. I don't know if he's going to hold his head. (laughs) And in the very beginning, he put Adam on earth and said, you have me. And in the Garden of Eden, there is no sin. There is no temptation. Adam is given to rule over all dominion. He's the pinnacle of creation. And he has God all to himself. And God says, this isn't good. And Adam falls over. (laughs) And he lays there in the field and he says, I'm done, Lauren. I'm lonely. (laughs) 
And God took from his side and created Eve, not from his head, not beneath him from under his feet, from his side, a helpmate in life, that two will come together and become one. And God said, I will create her. And he made Eve, and he put Eve in the garden. He took a little more time molding her, as you can tell. She is exquisitely made, and together they will glorify God. And Adam's like, that's what I'm talking about. (laughs) I love in the Hebrew, male, female, it is ish and isha. He created ish and ish, ah. (laughs) And ish got back up and went, ah. And they started a conversation there in the garden. And he's like, hey, I know you're a senior and I'm a freshman and I'm two years older than you. But I like the way you're molded. And she's all, yeah, yeah, you're funny. And he's all, I love that pink tan. Where do you get that from? And she goes, oh, I'm Jewish. And he's all, no way. I like Jewish people so much, I'm studying them here (laughs) because it was a a school of theology, hypothetically speaking. (laughs) And she's all, you got an odd-shaped head, but you're funny. And he's like, I'll take that. This is the longest someone like you's ever talked to someone like me. (laughs) And they started walking together, Ish and Ish. uh, And over the course of the next two years, Ish and Isha realized we should put a ring on this. So he bought the best one he could find. (laughs) This is actually Amy's. I borrowed it for today. It's a a 76 carat diamond. Mm, They put a ring on it. And after two and a half years of amazing dating, they got married and realized marriage is nothing like the brochure. Two broken people that have been trying their best to fool each other for two years have now come together and real life happens and this isn't going to (laughs) work. And after eight months, they have to have a conversation on how do we explain to our friends we're taking this off. There's no hatred. There's nothing being thrown. It's just the reality that we gave it a best shot and it didn't work. And he's like, I don't like being married to you. And she said, I don't like being married to you. He's all my needs aren't being met. And she goes, what are they? And he goes, well, sex. (laughs) Okay, my need isn't being met. (laughs) It's more singular. And she said, well, my needs aren't being met either. And he goes, you mean need? And she goes, no, I have a list. You used to just hold my hand when we walked. You used to write poetry. You used to bring flowers. You used to be so loving. You used to be so caring. Now you're all about your work. You used to spend money on me, and now you don't. And he had an answer for all of it. I spent all my money dating you. (laughs) You know I didn't have any. I'm a youth pastor in L.A. with inner city kids. And and, and he says, you know how when you go to the mall and you see those machines, the claws, and then there's a stuffed animal you really want? And you put your dollar in, and then you, you try to get the stuffed animal, and you have to put another dollar in and dollar in. Finally, you get your prize. When you get your prize, you stop putting dollars in. And, and, and he thought that was a brilliant way to explain the lack of poetry and flowers and romance. <laughs> because I, I won my stuffed animal. And she said, well, if, if you won me that way, that's how you also keep me. And he thought, I want a different stuffed animal. But he was a youth pastor at a Baptist church. And and for the point of this illustration, all you need to know about Baptists is if your youth pastor gets a divorce, he's not your youth pastor anymore. And he loved those inner city kids. And, And what you do in this situation is you take the ring off, you serve a paper, and you serve a paper, and you begrudgingly sign, and you thank God there weren't kids yet. And you go your separate ways. And the question is, if we're trying to follow Christ, in these circumstances where you're miserable and there's no love, and you tried your best but it doesn't work, can't you get a divorce? 
And Jesus says, before I talk about divorce, can I redefine marriage for you? And I want you to write this down. You see, God created marriage so he gets to define it. God created marriage so he gets to define it. Jesus did not answer according to culture. It's what we're doing today. I'm not going to give you answers today that our culture, our state, our country is going to agree with. He went back to page one and two of the Bible. For this reason, man will leave his mother and father, cling to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. See, he created marriage. This isn't something, a construct we came up with. This isn't something Western civilization. This isn't an American institution. This goes back to the garden, the first two pages of the Bible. He created it. He made the pattern, the blueprints. He has the patent on marriage, so he gets to define it. And he says marriage, number two, is not just a commitment between two people. It is the fusion of two parts to make one whole. Marriage is not a commitment between two people. It is the fusion of two parts to make one whole, one bios. He goes, look, I'm glad you two came together. I'm glad you got a ring. I'm glad you put a ring on it. I'm glad you signed papers. But this is something God has created. God knows how it works. And it only works according to the way the creator made it. He said, so it's not about your ring and it's not about the papers you sign. He said, for this reason, Ish will see Isha. And the two will come together in a union of marriage. And God says, here's biblical marriage. The two now become one flesh. They're no longer two. They are now fused to be one. <laughs> I know it looks like a two-headed monster. And some of you are like, there's our marriage. So you can take the ring off, and he said, you can sign the papers, but you're still a one flesh union. And nowhere in the Bible can you find rings, or certificate of marriage, or certificate of divorce. Huh. You find a one flesh union. And, and if we're going to teach this, we've now got at least a thousand or more here that go, you're, Chris, you're talking about nine years ago. Chris, you're talking about 14 years ago. So you're saying every time I'm with my current spouse and we have three kids, that, that's committing adultery because God still sees me as a one flesh union? Yeah. See, the, the, the truth about divorce, biblical divorce can only happen because of sexual unfaithfulness or desertion by a non-Christian. Biblical divorce can only happen because of sexual unfaithfulness, which Jesus claims right here. Or in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul will write to a church in Corinth where people are becoming Christians. The spouse wants nothing to do with them and deserts them. He goes, well, if you're deserted by your spouse, that's really not on you now, is it? See, God only sees two categories of relationship. There's not married, single, or divorce. God only sees married or single. God doesn't see divorce. You're either married, you're still in this one state union, or you're single. There's no such thing as divorce. You say, well, well I divorced a spouse because sexual immorality. I divorced a spouse because, okay, now God sees you as single, not divorced. I divorced the spouse because my unbelieving spouse got up and left, or I was deserted. Okay, then God doesn't see you as divorced. Now, here's what you have to understand. Both Paul's answer to this and Jesus are response to questions that were currently happening. No one in the New Testament ever walked up to Jesus or Paul or one of the disciples and said, hey, this is my sister, my idiot brother-in-law is bashing her around the house every other week. You can still see the bruises. Jesus never answered that. Paul never answered that. Neither of them gave an exhaustive, all-inclusive list of what you can and can't do, probably because there isn't one. What he went back to is, let me give you a new definition of this. So when Chris says, I don't like being married, and Amy says, I don't like being married to you either, 24 years ago, they realized, but I'm stuck. 
So we can live miserable, and we've done that for eight months, uh, about six. The first two months were okay. <laughs> we're still fooling each other. We can live miserable. We can get a divorce, which is unbiblical. I can't divorce you just because I'm miserable and I married the wrong person. Or we can try to fix this. And we took our list of what we didn't like, and each of us said, let's work on the list. And I knew I was going to be stuck in a loveless marriage, but hopefully it wasn't miserable for the next 40 years. And I had no idea that in doing this, I'm pulling off Ephesians 5, where God says, because you are in a one flesh union, husbands, when you love your wife, you're actually loving yourself. Because you're not, she's, you're, you're one. You say, Chris, does that mean there's things that you do for Amy just to get your own way and get what you want? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> I would say probably 80% of the stuff I do for Amy. I don't want to do it. See, that's just dumb stuff, like make the bed. I'm like, we're using it again today. Today we're using it. I mean, it's later, but it's today. No one's coming over. No one's walking into a room. The bed has to be made. Man, if I do this, this goes better for me. But if I point out how ridiculous this is, well, I ain't using the bed tonight. <laughs> My side's going to be made. Yes. And no one told me in doing this, we are going to unleash the fusion, this intimacy of what God created us to be and do. You see, he created it. He knows how it works. And, and, and if we can redefine this, maybe we can f- be free from 80% of our questions on divorce. You see, my senior year in high school, we had a Marine recruiter that would come by every so often. And there was about, I don't know, eight or 12 of us that he was keying on. Those of us that were seniors, um, for whatever reason, we were all in sports, we're all in football, and none of us had a clue what we're doing after graduation. The people that already had their college picked out or working in dad's business, he left alone. But us, he saw us as easy targets. I want to go play for Angelo State Rams in San Angelo, Texas, but I, I don't want to go through more work. I'm just, I'm lazy. And so I kept hanging out with him for two reasons. One, he would buy lunch for us. And secondly, we could get out of fourth period if we met with the recruiter. Now, I'm smart enough to know if you let me out of fourth period, there ain't no fifth or sixth. Peace. (laughs) And my buddy Pat and I would hang out with this guy. And Pat's like, Chris, we ought to try it. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, we ought to sign up and just try it. I go, Pat, you don't try it. Now, listen, I realize we have some eight, 900 families here that wear camouflage on a daily basis. Let me tell you, it wasn't my knock against the Marines. It's because of my utmost respect for the Marine Corps and what it takes to get in it and stay in it that I realized I didn't have. Coming from a family where my dad was in the military, I realized, man, that ain't my life. And Pat's like, look, we'll go through it, and if we don't like it, we'll come home. And I go, it doesn't work that way, Pat. (laughs) I go, you know, hell week, two weeks before school starts, we have two practices a day in 114-degree heat outside of El Paso, Texas. I go, it's the worst two weeks of life, Pat. They have three months of boot camp. He goes, yeah, but if we get into it and we don't like it, I mean, we can come home. I go, it don't work that way. They own you. He goes, no, Chris, if we refuse and say we're coming home, there's probably a bus and they'll put us on and we can come home. (laughs) Well, tell me how that works for you. See, Pat's view of signing up for the Marine Corps was, we'll try it. We'll get into it. If it doesn't work for us, peace. My view was, they own you. They own you. I don't want to be owned right now. And he goes, if you have this definition of marriage, let's try it. Let's get into it. Let's work our best. I mean, no one goes in planning for divorce, but we know if it doesn't, we can come back home. And God goes, no, 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 no. They own you. Because we didn't create marriage and decide on how marriage works. We don't get to decide divorce. And God goes, you can go through all the legalities. I get to approve of divorce, and you were never divorced. What do we do with this? Well, So, Chris, my divorce 17 years ago wasn't for sexual unfaithfulness because we couldn't live together. We were young. We were stupid. Now I'm married. We've got four kids. Am I supposed to leave them? No, but doesn't the Bible say, yeah, but are you? Ah. Can we just get back to the truth about all of us? Let's just end on the truth about all of us, okay? You see, none of us will get to heaven because of what we have done. None of us. That's one of those statements that when I wrote it, I realized it actually goes both ways. 
hey, look, none of you will get to heaven because of what you have done. But that statement can also read, hey, look, none of you are going to get to heaven because of what you've done. <laughs> you see that? A little tone inflection makes all the difference. And both are true. None of us can get to heaven by what we've done. And none of us can get to heaven because of what we've done. I want to put it this way. All of us have at least one page in the Bible that we didn't get right. All of us. All of us have at least one page in the Bible that we can look at and go, yeah, I didn't get that one right. Oh, may I be the first to say, my pages make up chapters. My chapters make up a book. You want to take pages out of the Bible where I've blown it? I'm, it's, it's going to be thick. It is going to be thick. And so I realize when we do this topic, we cannot point at them. For those of you in marriage and go, that's what we're working on. That's what I have to do. Oh, but man, them, they're on their second marriage or they're on their third marriage. There is no them when we read these pages. It's just us. I want to take you back. Last place we look is Romans chapter 3. If you're in Mark, go to the right. Luke, John, Acts, Romans chapter 3. We did the book of Romans here a couple years ago, verse by verse. Phenomenal study even if I do say so myself. And the first three chapters spelled out six different ways why no one can get to heaven. He is a holy God. He is sinless. We've all got some aspect of sin. Sin cannot be in heaven. So when you die, it's you. And you've got no way to get rid of the sin that's in your life. And there's no amount of good that you can do right now that takes away already the wrong that you've done. And if God allowed a bunch of sinners in heaven, we'd turn it into the Vegas Strip within three months. And God would have to move and find a new heaven. Sin had to be dealt with. And by the end of chapter 3, actually we're going to pick it up in verse 9. Paul writes, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one that is righteous. There's no one that can stand in front of God and say, I'm pure enough, I'm holy. Not even one of us. There is no one who understands, no one who truly seeks God. All have turned away. They've all together become worthless. That's the human nature without God. There is no one who does good, not even one. Talking about being perfect enough. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He writes, look, all of us in some way, shape, or form, by what we said, by what we came up with, by the words I've used, by the way I've cursed people, by the way I've treated people, all of us have pages against us to go, yep, that one was me. I mean, I was good on that and that, but whoo, number three just got me. He's all, none of us can stand before a holy God and say, I'm good enough to be in your presence. He goes, we can. And then it concludes with this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth can be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law, rather through the law, We become conscious of sin. No one can stand before God and say, I did this good enough. You have way too many pages against you. No one. And we're all on equal ground. Oh, if you hear this message or other messages here at North Coast, and you're quick to tell somebody, hey, you're a sinner. At North Coast, we applaud that. As long as it is followed by a high five and a hug that says, welcome to the club. (laughs) Hey, you're a sinner? High five. Welcome to the club. No one is allowed here to take any verse, any chapter that doesn't pertain to you, but apply to someone else and go, you're a sinner. Don't. You call yourself a Christian and you love pointing out sin and people leave. There's plenty of Christian churches that would accept you, love you, and heaven will see who was right. Not here. Not here. The trauma and the consequences that this issue causes, there's, it's absolutely no coincidence that the very next verses in Mark chapter 10 have little children coming to Jesus and the disciples pull them away and Jesus says, no, you let the little children come to me. It is no coincidence that on his harshest teaching of divorce, there's this next view of you better allow the children to be free and come to me. Because man, there's a lot of consequences that are damaging with this issue and it cuts deep. 
And all of us have pages against us. <laughs> and, and then Romans says this. But now, a righteousness being found right, being made right from God apart from the Bible has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned, all fall short of God's glory, but are justified, are made right freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Can I tell you the truth about the cross? The cross brings grace and mercy, not what I deserve. Do you realize, please, church, that Jesus has just turned he and his disciples to cross the Jordan to head to Judea? To Judea. Why? Because he has just told his followers, I am going to take the cross. Why? Because I have a really harsh stance on divorce and a really clear definition of marriage. And a lot of people aren't going to get this one right. And the cross is necessary. You don't need more time and patience to figure out your life. Nope, you're going to keep screwing it up. <laughs> you don't need another chapter on marriage to make yours better. Nope, you're an idiot just like me. You don't need a little bit more of God's instruction in your life to make you better. It won't happen. The instruction just shows us where we've blown it. What we needed was a cross. What we needed was a God that said, this is what I teach. And I don't know how to straighten out where you are now. And you can't go back and redo. What if I bring forgiveness? What if the cross redeems, buys back, makes right, not just your past, but your present? What if the cross not only redeems sin, but people? And this is why I love Ephesians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old you has gone. The new is now here. All this is from God, who brought us to himself through Christ and now has given us this same ministry of reconciliation, that God was bringing the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the same message of reconciliation. And it's the only way I can stand here today. A guy that used every relationship he had for about six years of his life for his own gratification. A guy that was so arrogant and so prideful and prided himself on being a life of the party but just couldn't tell anybody he lived for the crowds because when the crowds left, he hated who he was with. And the only reason any of us can stand on any ground today and say, well, what makes you a good Christian? I just point at the cross and go him. I couldn't do it. I can't earn it. I will never deserve it. It's been freely given. I surrendered to him. And when it comes to a church in Corinth that is one of the most sexually charged environments in its day in the Greek and Roman world in the first century, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, 17. So you've become a Christian now. Today you want to follow him. Each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has found them, just as God now calls them. This is a rule I lay down in all churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands now is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God has called them. Brothers and sisters, each person now has a responsibility to God to remain in the situation they were in when God has now called them. Well, Chris, what do I do? Because my first marriage and my second, but today I'm, I, I don't. Here's what the cross brings. <laughs> the truth about the cross, it allows obedience to start today. 
I don't know what happened five years ago, 10 years ago, and 15 years ago in your life. I don't know if you walked in here living together and realizing, so all sexual intimacy, lust, desires, physical, is between man and woman in marriage. For a lot of you, you go, Phew. he goes, yeah, some are going to be eunuchs. Some are going to be celibate. Some were born to be single, and Paul says that's a gift. And there's a gift of singleness that you can do far more. Some of you, because divorced, have chosen to be single. Some of you widowed, you want to remain single. He goes, there's a gift to be all that you can be and do all that you want to do. Because the moment you get married, <laughs> your dreams are gone. It's about somebody else, not just you. He goes, this is a hard teaching. I understand it. If you want to teach this to a culture that doesn't agree with it, good luck with that, buddy. But this is the word of God. And Paul says, so if, if today you're in a marriage that's loveless and miserable, there hasn't been any sexual unfaithfulness. He says, and you start with obedience today. You make a list not to show where someone's wrong. You make a list to say, here's how I got to start meeting your needs. And have them make a list to say, here's how i got to start meeting your needs. And if you're in your second marriage or third marriage, and if you're in a place where we've all blown this in ways, you just go, what does it look like today? How do I start today because of grace and mercy? Oh, are there consequences? Sure. <laughs> you're living out those consequences. You know them well. But obedience starts today. God says, look, I can't give all the answers about divorce. What I can do is redefine marriage. Because you think you can just put this on and you think you can put this off. And he goes, that's just an outward symbol of what I've fused together. And, and you laid that ring down long ago. I still see you as married. And in Christ, the old is gone. The new has come. I'm a new creation. And the cross doesn't hold my sin against me. Oh, there may still be consequences. So today I start and say, if this is who I am, or if today you're single, or let me just speak in closing, those of you that are living together, because we do kids' sign-ups, we love that you are here. And we don't want you to feel less than anybody else. We all have pages where we're not doing right. But I, I'm going to say this publicly so I don't have to have those awkward phone calls or with you privately. When we get names to volunteer in the kids' program, and they're different last names, same address, we're going to ask, hey, are you guys living together? And you're going to hear these words. There's other places you can volunteer or do stuff here. Not, not in the kids' area. We, we don't want you to be an example in front of kids, a boyfriend and girlfriends that can live together when that's not what we're going to teach them. And that's going to be hard for you to hear. And you're going to feel like you're judged. And can I say you are? Because all of us are. We're all sinners. And we're not going to point at you without a high five and a hug and say, welcome to the club. But, but if you want to be an example in front of kids and teach the Bible or be in a room of what it says, then we're going to ask you to live according to the word of God. We're not going to apologize for that, but we are going to realize that is hard and that is difficult. And for some of you that are single today, you found new guidelines to how I do my singleness. And I don't have the answer to all the questions that fill this room on this teaching. Here's what I know. There's a God that says, Chris, you have screwed this up so much. We are not going to go back and try to untangle this. I'm going to give you grace. And I'm going to give you mercy. I'm going to give you what you couldn't possibly earn or deserve. And mercy is holding back what you really do deserve. And instead, today, I'm going to teach you how to walk with me. And let's start today. Plan B. Because I don't know how to sort out plan A. Let's start today with plan B and be his. Whew. That's the cross. And that's why we all need it. Father, thank you for your word. And the clarity of it, especially in areas that we do not like. And God, we are going to walk back into our culture today and wonder what we want to do with your book because it does not apply to what we think, to what we know, to how we live. And so, Father, I ask that you give us enough wisdom to realize we've done life on our own and it hasn't worked. It's time to do it your way. And today, lay down and surrender. That may mean celibacy in a lot of areas for us until we come together in a one flesh union. God, may you be with marriages today that desperately want divorce and today gave them a new definition of, I've got to work on this. And it seems so unfair but God, may we realize when we do that, we are stepping into your grace, your power, your obedience. And may you meet us there and give us what we need.
for the hundreds of questions that have been unanswered but just created by this message. May you allow us to see what obedience looks like today and follow you because of how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as always, we'd love to connect with you online. If you have a question, a comment, or even a prayer request, you can send that to info at northcoastchurch.com. We also want to thank you for your continued generous support. If you'd like to give, you can donate through the North Coast Church app or the website at northcoastchurch.com. We hope you're challenged and encouraged by today's message. We'll see you next week.